Welcome to the Grind and Gratitude Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. If this is your first time tuning in, I appreciate you. If you're an avid listener, you know I got nothing but love for you. I am Danny Stone, also known as Coach Stone is in the building. I help coaches, speakers, authors, and consultants speak to make more income, impact, and influence. Now, look, this is a very special episode. This is our one 100th episode of the Grind and Gratitude Show. And I want to thank you all for tuning in all around the world. I love getting your messages. I love hearing that you're sharing the podcast with other people. I love hearing that you're learning and you're growing. And it's because of you that me and my team continue to do this. And so because this is a very special episode, I needed to get a very special guest. And so I searched everywhere and I found this guest. Now, look, I have to tell you a little bit about her, right? She does so many different things. She's a certified culinary nutritionist. She's a TV guest wellness expert. She has her own podcast. She's the author of a book called Unbreakable. She's a brain health uh, expert that's done uh, work with Clean Eating Magazine. She designed a course for them. Man, I'm getting tired saying all this. And She's the founder of the RISE Method, a step-by-step framework to help people overcome stress, overwhelm, and fatigue. But the most important title that she has out of all of that is she's my wife. Welcome to the podcast, Trudy Stone. Thank you for having me, Danny, and congratulations on 100 episodes. That is awesome. Yeah, I mean, thanks for being here, babe. I really appreciate it. I know you're you're super busy. We had to put this in the calendar because she's very organized, everybody. <laughs> but you're here. So thank you for being on the podcast. So many people have been asking for us to do this, this episode. I think I was on your podcast a while ago, right? Right, that's right. Mm-hmm. And then ever since then, everybody's like, you guys need to do more of this. You gotta, we're both so busy. We're doing our own podcast. We're doing coaching and speaking and Finally, I was like the 100th episode. I got to, you got to be on it. So thank you so much for being here, babe. Oh, thanks for having me. I got my green smoothie. I'm ready to go. She's very healthy and <laughs> nutritious, everyone. She's very healthy. This is going to be a fun episode. Uh, you know, we're celebrating 100 episodes, but we're celebrating all kinds of things. You know, we're celebrating helping people to, to get healthy. We're, help, we're celebrating helping people to get healthy physically, mentally, spiritually, financially. And um, that's something that both you and I, you know, we really take a lot of pride in, in helping people to do that, right? That's right. Absolutely. All right, babe. So we got a lot to talk about. There's so many things to talk about. But I think the first thing that we should talk about is you're a culinary nutritionist. Why don't you kind of tell people what that is? Because I know people are like, what is that? <laughs> yes, I get asked that question a lot. Uh, So a culinary nutritionist, that just means that I'm an expert in the therapeutic properties of foods in both the prevention of diseases as well as treating and healing certain diseases. No, that's great. That's great. And so we're going to talk about how you kind of got into the whole food aspect and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, because you're you're a culinary expert, like talk to what, what was, and I know some of some of this stuff, but like, what was growing up like for you? Like, do you have early childhood memories of cooking or where did your love for, for food start? Yeah. Oh my God. That's a deep question right off the bat for me. I knew that's I was going to be it. in the hot seat. <laughs> uh, well, food growing up for me, I mean, I grew up in a single parent household, right? My mom was a single parent. Um, I have two older sisters and my sisters are actually a lot older than me, um, 10 years older than me and nine years older than me. So I'm quite the baby in the family. So because my mom was a single mom, you know, that meant that she was working really hard. She was working long hours. And because my sisters were older than me, hey, they were out doing their own thing and they were hanging out with their friends. So a lot of times I was home by myself and I had to kind of fend for myself when it came to making meals. Now, I don't want to throw my mom under the bus. My mom was an amazing mom. My mom did sacrifice so much for me. And if I talk about that, I'm going to start shedding tears like crazy. However, like I said, it just meant that I was home a lot by myself. So I had to get really creative with certain meals and certain foods, like making my lunches for school, you know, making my dinners and that sort of thing. So I think that's really where my love of food started because I just, we didn't have a lot because again, single parent household. So I kind of had to work with what I had, which meant, you know, kind of getting creative with different foods. No, that's great. I think you and I both kind of have that, that same kind of upbringing. I remember 
my mom was working and I have a younger brother and a younger sister. And I would just be coming up with meals out of whatever we had in the cupboard. So I would just figure out how I could put a bunch of different ingredients together and make it taste decent. And then, and then even before that, I remember going to my grandparents' house and they had a little garden. And I remember at four or five, just helping my grandmother cook. So I really started at a young age as well. So I, I definitely have a love for cooking. I'm not, I'm not an expert like you. I'm <laughs> <laughs> <Am> I? <laughs> uh, you're good in the kitchen. You, you, you know how to, you know, you're, you're, you're a good cook and you know how to make things, healthy things taste good as well. Like, you know, we're going to talk about that, but like, so over the years, you know, I know that you've done lots of different things and you used to work in the corporate world. Like talk a little bit about like how you went from working in the corporate world to being a nutritionist. Well, how did that happen? Oh, shoot. That is a long and windy road. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was the, What was the catalyst for oh, it, for the God. change? Let me, what was the catalyst for the change? Well, the catalyst for the change was I just knew that I could do more. Like I was really, I was always really good at what I did in my job. Um, but I just knew that being inside of, you know, these four walls, being inside of this cubicle, I knew that I was destined for so much more. And I had a lot more skills and a lot more passion that I wanted to be able to utilize in the world. Um, and I think Danny, I don't really think I started getting into entrepreneurship until I met you, to be very honest. I think you really lit the fire under me in terms of entrepreneurship and starting my own business and actually really believing that I could do it. So it's no surprise that you help so many people to do that now and that you're so good at that because you definitely helped me with that. So the very first thing that I did, um, my very first business was, and I always laugh when I say this because it's just amazing to see how far I've come. So the very first business I had was a cupcake business. So I had this cupcake business. It was called Sublime Creations and it was a mobile cupcake bar. So what I would do was I would bake cupcakes, like different types of cupcakes, and then I would set up like the naked cupcakes and then I would set up like different types of frosting. So I had all these different types of frostings. I had all these different types of toppings and I would do like these things at like different parties. I would actually do them in malls as well. So here in Toronto, I would go to some malls in Toronto. Easter was a popular time. And I would do like this whole setup with all these cupcakes and the kids would decorate them with their own icing and their own sprinkles and that sort of thing. And I loved it and it was a hit. But then, you know, I, my, my passion kind of changed and then I started doing other things. But um, yeah, I love doing that. And I still love baking because I have such a huge sweet tooth. I love that cupcake business. I used to be the taste tester. Yes, you were. <laughs> I remember were. getting all, I was like, let me try this cupcake for you. Okay, let me try this cupcake. Yeah, that was a really cool concept. I remember going with you to some of the events and, you know, the kids and, and the, the events and, and the weddings and all the stuff you used to do. That was pretty cool. It was nice to see, you know, people just decorating their cupcakes and eating them. That was, that was pretty dope. Um, but you had a, you were, um, what's that? A lot of late nights in the kitchen, man. Uh, I was in that kitchen till like 3 a.m., like baking cupcakes. I did like um, different baking shows too. So, um, but the baking shows, because you have hundreds, potentially thousands of people coming through these shows, I would, you know, be up like quite late, like baking at like three o'clock in the morning. So yeah, it was, whew, it was a time. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you have to try and you tried. You, it, the thing about it is so many people have an idea and they never try and you mm -hmm. did. And, and one of the things, but you also, you also used to do event planning, right? Mm -hmm. I remember, I remember, you know, you, you, I, I think you started with event planning and then got into the cupcake thing. Was that how it went? Yeah, it was. Yeah. So I took um, a certification. So I'm certified, I'm actually a certified event planner. Um, so I took a certification in event planning. And then when I was doing the event planning, I was looking for different jobs. I just didn't really find like any sort of jobs that really just kind of lit my fire in terms of event planning. Um, but what did light my fire was baking. Like baking was something that I really enjoyed. It was a hobby for me. And then I thought to myself, well, why can't I just turn into this hobby into an actual business? So that's what I did. I turned the hobby into a business. So sometimes like when we think about things we want to do in life, like we know that we want to do more. We know that we might want to start a business. Just think about those things that you just do naturally. Things that people will say to you, oh my God, like, damn, like, I can't believe that you do that thing so effortlessly. Because a lot of times things that come effortlessly to you don't necessarily come effortlessly to other people and people will pay you for that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. A lot of us are, you know, a lot of people may be working in a job right now, a lot of people who are listening and, and they might have a desire to start their own business. And they're like, well, I can't do what my cousin's doing. She's doing 
drop shipping. He's doing a cooking. She's doing this. He's doing that. Don't compare yourself to other people. Start with the things that you're good at. What do people come to you for? What do they right. tell you that you're really great at? What do they come to you for advice for? That's a great place to start. It's already something that comes natural. Right. And I think a lot of us see other people doing things and, and maybe making money. And then we think that we should be doing what they're doing, but do mm. what comes natural. Right. Right. Um, yeah, that's good, babe. Uh, so th the other thing too is, I'm sure, and I know, I know my listeners, they're already thinking, okay, how does she go from cupcakes to, to nutrition? Like, what was that transition? See, I just rhymed there. What was that like? Well, what had happened was I was dating this fine man, okay? He was fine. He got down on one knee, asked me to be his wife. And then I was like, girl, you got a dress you got to fit into. <laughs> and I wasn't going to fit into that dress baking cupcakes every single day. So that was actually kind of part of it. Um, so I started to lose weight, right? So I wanted to look a certain way when I got married. I always envisioned myself looking a certain way. Um, a lot of women, you know, whenever you have like a special occasion, right? If there's like a reunion you're going to go to or you're getting married or whatever it might be, whenever there's that special occasion, we always want to lose weight, right? So I was no different. I had gained, you know, some weight after doing all the cupcake stuff and I wanted to start losing the weight. So what I actually did was I, I studied a lot of different medical journals. I started like Harvard Medical Journal, so many different medical journals and research papers in terms of weight loss and what was working. And the reason why I did that was because I had a history of losing weight, gaining a back, losing weight, gaining a back. And I said, you know what? When I lose weight for this wedding, I want to lose it once and for all. I don't want to be on this hamster wheel of losing it and gaining it back. I want to lose it this time and lose it for good. So what can I do? What can I do differently than what I've done before? So that's why I started studying a lot of different, um, you know, research journals and medical journals and that sort of thing. And the more that I learned was the more that I wanted to learn because I was learning a lot of different scary things about the weight loss industry. And I was eating foods that I thought were good for me, but actually weren't really good for me and were making my weight loss efforts even worse. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, like I said, that's kind of like when the fire like started to light in me in terms of nutrition. And I'd never really been interested in nutrition before. I mean, I was, I was a cupcake lady, right? Mm. <laughs> so as I started going down this rabbit hole, I just became so interested in nutrition. And then I took a course. So, you know, Danny knows this about me. Anytime I am like super into something, or if I want to learn more about something, or if I become passionate about something, for me, I don't just stop at like reading a book or watching YouTube videos. I take like a course or a certification. So that's why I have certifications and a, a bunch of different random things. Um, so I took a certification in nutrition. And at that time, it was not because I wanted to become a nutritionist. It was simply because I wanted to learn more, right? So I took the course in nutrition. And as I'm going through the certification, I'm like, well, Trudy, like you're learning all of this. You're helping people along the way because I was sharing a lot of what I was learning with people. People were also seeing that I was losing weight and they were asking me how I was doing it. So then actually midway through the course, I was like, I want to actually do this as a career. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God. So it was kind of an identity shift, like going from the cupcake lady to now like, you know, wanting to do new, new, new nutrition. But like I said, the more that I learned about the, the diet and the weight loss industry was the more that I knew women did not know this information. I didn't know this information. I knew women didn't know this information. And I felt like I was going to be selfish if I just sat on that and didn't share it with people. So that was kind of my journey um, and my segue from cupcakes into nutrition. And then, of course, I said yes to the dress. I fitted the dress and, you know, the rest is history. You, listen, you were, <laughs> when you walked down that aisle, woo, when I saw you walk down in that dress, I was like, damn, my wife is fine. And I seen you in that dress, boy. It was like, wow, you know, you looked amazing in the dress. We had an amazing wedding. The, the, the um, celebration afterwards was the reception was amazing. And um, yeah, I, I definitely saw, I saw the results of you really, um, of, your, of, your, of your transforming, not, not just your body, but like your whole mindset around eating and nutrition. And, yeah. and yeah. I think that's something that people can understand. Like you, a lot of our identity was formed from childhood, right? A lot of our ideas around food, around money, around work, around relationships, a lot of that was formed before the age of 10. And as adults, we continue to carry that identity, right? And, you know, especially me, like the way that I ate, we never had a lot of money growing up. So I, we had to get creative with food. And, you know, I think that's the case for so many people. We have this identity and we don't know that 
we're able to shift our identity. You can change your identity just like you can change your story. And so you were the cupcake lady and then you became the nutrition lady. And it's perfectly okay for anybody to change their path, right? And I think that's one of the things that people should get from that. You can start down one thing, you can fully go down that, that route, like be passionate about it, explore it, and then change your mind and be passionate about something else. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, so you know, that. yeah, you know what I what I was gonna say too, Danny, was that I'm the type of person that I would rather try something and even fail at it or not have it work out than to never have tried it at all. Because I hate should have, could have, would have. I don't want to be in a rocking chair when I'm like 89 years old and be like, oh my God, what if I had tried the cupcakes? Like, would that have worked out? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I would rather, because every time, even if you fail at something, it's information. That's what you have to realize. Because sometimes when people try something and they fail at it, they don't get back up and they just stay stuck there, right? But again, you have to think of that as information because now you know right now you know what you know what you can do maybe now you know what your limitations are now you know what you can do better than next time now you might have learned something that hey like this is not for me i actually want to do this thing instead so anytime things don't work out in life always think about that as information and always think about that as what is the situation trying to tell me no that's good but you know i think sometimes people they want to do something and they feel like they're called or being pulled to to do something but they don't answer the call hmm. and you did and so many people do but i think you have to answer the call because just like you said who wants to be thinking of what if i had have tried right and you know one of the i remember one of the stories that you told me about the bathroom stall <laughs> I, I think yeah I, I tell that story because you know i think uh, well, maybe no. a lot of women may may relate or a lot of men maybe even relate to that but i think there's things that happen in our life that we ignore. And then there's things that happen in our life that we have no choice but to take action on. And when I remember you telling me this story, I was like, yeah, that, that, that seemed to be one of those defining moments for you. So tell everybody about that story. Oh, yeah. So like I told you, I was baking the cupcakes. All right. And I was tasting all the cupcakes just like Danny. Right. So the weight started to pass on. But, you know, what I didn't mention about the cupcake company was that although I had started this business, it actually was a side hustle for me and I was still working full time. So I was doing that on the side and then I was still working full time. So what happened was in the bathroom stall was I had just got out of a meeting. I was at work, just got out of a meeting. And, you know, when you just got out of a meeting and now like maybe you've been in the meeting for like two hours and now everybody has to use the bathroom. So we're walking to the bathroom, me and my coworker, we go into the bathroom. We're talking about the meeting, right? We go into the bathroom. She goes in her stall. I go in my stall. We're still talking between the stalls. You know, those awkward washroom chats where like you go into the bathroom at the same time as the person. And now like you carry the conversation through the stalls. <laughs> Anyways, that's what was going on. So we're talking back and forth. And then I'm trying to like button up my pants, trying to, but just kind of get the button to kind of go on. The button's not going in the hole. I'm like, what is going, you know, when you just keep pulling it, just keep, you know, trying to get the button to join with the hole. That's what I was doing in the bathroom. And I was like, man, what is going on here? I'm like, did I put these pants in the dryer when I shouldn't have? Maybe I put them on, you know, regular heat rather than delicate. Anyways, the button wouldn't go on. And that's when the worst thing happened. The button popped off and it flew right into the stall next to me where my coworker was. And you know, when you drop like a nickel or a dime and it just keeps spinning and spinning and spinning and it doesn't <laughs> stop, that was my button. Oh. And I was like, oh my God, I was so embarrassed. I was so mortified. And I'm thinking, I'm going to get a whole bunch of things in that moment. I'm thinking, how am I going to keep my pants up for the rest of the day? Number one. Number two, how can I bribe my coworker not to tell everybody what just happened as soon as she gets out of the bathroom? So I had all these things going on in my head, but you know, that was the, the catalyst really for me losing weight. Like, like, cause I kept blaming my dryer for shrinking my pants. I kept buying stretchy pants or I kept buying a bigger pair of pants. And that's when I was like, you know what? Look, Trudy, you got to stop making excuses. You got to take action and stop making excuses. And then that's kind of when the journey, you know, really started to begin. Yeah. I mean, that must've been embarrassing. Yeah. yeah. And it, you know, it's also, it was also a call to action for you as well. And I think we have so many of those moments in our life where something happens and we have to make a decision and in many cases many of us don't make the decision we just go back to doing what we've always done and and that's why i always say you you have to have the the the, the discipline to act on your curiosity if you're curious about something or something happens 
take action, try something. And you did, right? And it's okay. You've tried different things and now you ended up with what you, what is, I think, you know, your real purpose and your real passion. And, um, you know, everybody, when they see you on TV, you know, you're a regular guest expert on a national program and, in Canada, and, and people always send me messages. Oh, I saw your wife Trudy on TV. She's amazing. I just learned this tip, or I tried this recipe. You know, how does it feel when people reach out to you and they say that to you? I mean, it feels good, but I'm doing it for them. You know, that's how I always see it. And I feel like I'm going to get emotional talking about it. It's not for me, it's for them. It's for me to, and it's also important for me. And I have to say this as well it's important for me because I, you know, when I first started doing the TV appearances, I was like, who am I to be on TV, right? It's the whole imposter syndrome. Who am I to be on TV? Who am I to talk about brain health? A black woman talking about brain health? There's not a lot of people in that space. Shout out to Dr. Chrissy. Danny and I both know Dr. Chrissy. She's yeah, amazing. Look out. her up on Instagram. There's not a lot of black women in, you know, in the neuroscience space. There's not a lot of black women talking about brain health. So I kind of had that imposter syndrome as well, right? But I thought to myself, Trudy, if you could even help one person, Again, you are being selfish by sitting on that knowledge and not sharing it with other people. If you know that you have knowledge that can help to heal people, if you know that you have knowledge that can help to change somebody's life, if you have knowledge that can help to reverse a diabetes diagnosis, you are selfish if you don't share it. Mm -hmm. So really, that's why I do it. It's, it's just to help people, right? Um, and also, I want people to be passionate about taking care of themselves. I want them to be passionate about eating healthy because I think too often we think about eating healthy or taking care of ourselves as a chore. It's another thing on our to-do list that we just don't have the time for, okay? And if you don't make time for your health, then you gotta make time for disease. It's one or the other, okay? So that's wait, why- Wait, wait, say that again, say that again. <laughs> if you don't make time for your health, then you gotta make time for disease, okay? I wasn't the one who came up with this quote. This is a quote, you know, I've heard before, but it is so, so true. And too often we wait until, you know, we're like really, really sick to do something about our health, right? And, you, and then you sit there and you think to yourself, if only I had exercised more, if only I had, you know, maybe eaten a little bit less sugar. You don't want to be in that boat because I had somebody in my family who had diabetes and had to have an amputation because of diabetes. So you don't want to end up in that position where it's too far advanced and it's too late. And now you're trying to think about, okay, what can I do now? Okay. It's just about taking preventative measures, just doing a little bit every single day. It's not about being perfect. It's just being a little bit better than you were yesterday. That's it. Be a little bit better. And, you know, I got to say, you got me eating healthier. I, I was never, not, I wasn't the most, I wasn't someone who ate healthy and I wasn't someone who ate like really bad. I was someone in the middle. And uh, I'm glad, you know, you got me on eating all of these different things like cauliflower tacos. I never thought I would like this stuff and all of these other things. And one of the things that I like, and you and I talk about this all the time. One of the things that I like about the way you talk about food is you, you talk a lot about food swaps. Like sometimes when I see people talk about eating healthy, it's like really extreme. So somebody who enjoys a nice steak, they want them to become a vegan or a vegetarian, like the very extremes. And I love the fact that you get people to kind of swap out foods for healthier versions of the things that they like. Talk a little bit about that. Oh, that's one of my favorite things to do. I love remixing <laughs> foods. <laughs> remix with the remix. <laughs> yeah, you know, and as I, as I said earlier, I have a huge sweet tooth, right? And when I was trying to eat healthier and when I was trying to lose weight, that was the part that I had the hardest time with. It was sugar, like cookies specifically. Like I am, you think Cookie Monster loves cookies? Like <laughs> if you put me in Cookie Monster in a cookie eating contest, I don't know. I don't know. I might be taking the crown on that one, but you know, I love my cookies. So, you know, that's where I started. I just started with looking at my favorite, you know, foods that were unhealthy or that weren't the best for me. And I just tried to find ways to make them healthier. Okay. So, you know, for example, like I, oh, I don't have, I haven't posted it yet. It hasn't even come out yet, but I will be posting a cookie recipe. So it was like this chocolate chip cookie recipe that I made and I swapped out regular flour, which is heavily processed. Um, all of the nutrients get removed from just your regular all purpose flour. And instead I put in chickpea flour. The chickpea flour, you have protein in there, you have fiber in there, and chickpea actually acts as like a natural appetite suppressant. So I swapped out that flour and I put chickpea flour in there instead. I swapped out regular white sugar, which again is bleached, not good for you, and I put coconut palm sugar in there instead. 
And coconut palm sugar is, I don't want to say that there's any sugar that is good for you or healthy for you, but it's a better option than regular, you know, white table sugar because it doesn't spike your blood sugar as much. Okay. So it's just looking at some of your favorite, you know, unhealthy foods, and then just trying to see what are the ingredients that I can kind of swap out to make it just a little bit healthier. Yeah, that cookie was all right. I, I, at first I was like, mm, when you were telling me about this, I'm like, what are you trying to do? And then I tasted it. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. This is, this is not bad. This is pretty good. Yeah, so, chicken flour has like a bit of a sweet taste to it too. So that's the thing, yeah. Yeah, it does. It was actually a pretty good cookie. So yeah, I love the idea of swapping things. I, I, don't, I don't think being extreme just doesn't work for many people. And that's the problem with diet. You go from eating whatever to starving yourself to, you know, it just doesn't make sense. It's not sustainable. But when you talk about food swaps, like, you know, having a turkey burger instead of ground beef burger every once in a while, or using a thinner bun, or all of these little simple things that people can yeah. do. I think when you talk to people like that, you know, so many of my friends and so many people I know that follow you who try these recipes are like, oh, I actually like this. Oh, oh, I can do this. Like, I remember when you posted the cauliflower tacos, I think um, one of my friends, uh, comedian Jay Martin, you know, he's, uh, he tried it and he's like, hey, I tried the ca cauliflower taco thing. I was like, what? He said, yeah, it was actually pretty good. Uh, and so I get people saying those types of things all the time. And that's why I like the fact that, you know, it's not extreme. It, it's manageable for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, the other thing that I like that you talk about is like food and stress. Right. You, you talk a lot about what food and stress like talk, talk to us about that, what, what that looks like. Yeah, you know, that's an important one, because a lot of us turn there's a lot of women, especially turn to food to help them to manage stress, turn to food to help them to soothe, really. Right. You know, and as a nutritionist, this is something that I particularly find, you know, alarming because of the pandemic. Right. And a lot of us have been locked in our homes for a very long time. You know, there's been a lot of shifts in our lives, some good, but some not so great, right? And that's leaving us feeling anxious. That's leaving us feeling depressed. You know, some people are lonely, like some people who are single, maybe they don't have a partner in their lives. And now it's like, you're in this pandemic and you're home by yourself all the time. So, you know, whatever it is, a lot of people turn to food to help them to manage their emotions and, and turn to food to help to soothe them. So, you know, that's why I like talking about like stress busting foods, you know, because of that, but also because you know, we're under high amounts of stress right now, more, again, more than ever before with the pandemic, like things just, it slowed down for a little bit, but then I think for a lot of people, my clients anyways, things really picked up for them and things got really, really busy for them. Right. And the thing is when you're under these high amounts of stress, you know, there are certain nutrients that get depleted in your body during those high amounts of stress. And it's really important that we're mindful of that and that we're doing what we can to help our body to replenish, the, uh, replenish those lost nutrients. So, you know, for example, like one of them is like B vitamins. The B vitamins is something I love talking about because they're so important for your body. And when you're stressed out, stress completely burns out those B vitamins in your body. And vitamin B6 in particular is a key one because that helps your body to manufacture the neurotransmitter serotonin. And that's a neurotransmitter that makes you feel good and that makes you feel really happy, okay? So like I said, when you're under high amounts of stress, you know, these are just getting completely burned out. So sweet potatoes is a really great source of B vitamins. And there's so many things you can do with sweet mm. potatoes. Like I love, my favorite thing to do with it is a soup. So you might've seen me do this on City Line before. And Danny, I'll share that link with you if you want to pop that in the show notes. But yeah. it's a sweet potato, carrot, lentil soup. Okay, so um, you put the lentils in there. Like even if you haven't had lentils before, maybe your kids aren't on board with the lentils. Maybe your husband's not on board with lentils like Danny wasn't at one time. <laughs> hey, 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 don't put my business out there. You're good. Don't now. put my like, business, you know, don't, don't put my business out there like that. <laughs> you know, you tuck the lentils in there, right? You're never going to even know that they're in there, but you're going to benefit from those nutrients. Okay. So lentils are a great source of protein. They're a great source of complex carbohydrates. They're a great source of fiber. And a lot of people are, you know, deficient in fiber. So B vitamins is definitely one of them. Iron is another important one too. That's, that's a key one because one of the most common um, symptoms of an iron deficiency is fatigue right? You feel really tired. You feel really run down. So that's another one that gets burnt out um, in your body during times of stress. So, you know, adding in those iron rich foods um, and, you know, and I would say before you even start popping a supplement, because a lot of times, you know, if I say this, I know someone right now is going to go buy an iron supplement, start popping an iron supplement. First of all, 
before you add any supplements, you want to check with your doctor and make sure that, you know, get your iron levels checked, make sure your iron levels are, you know, low enough for you to be taking that supplement and take it from there. But you can just get some of these nutrients and foods. So iron rich foods are things like, you know, spinach, broccoli, um, lentils, pumpkin seeds is a great one as well. And, um, and quinoa, these are all really, really great sources of iron. Yeah, I think, you know, food, the, the fact that food can help you manage stress, the fact that food can help you in so many areas of your life, instead of turning to medication. And a lot of people, if they just change their diet and change what they ate, probably wouldn't have to be on a lot of the medications that they're on. Oh, and so we, yeah. and we have to start thinking as food as the original source of, of medicine. Food is medicine, right? And I know you say this all the time, but people have to understand that. Like, yeah. it's just, talk to like, you just name some of the things that people should be eating. But like, when, when you hear food is medicine, what come, what do you say about that? Yeah, you know, like Hippocrates said, like, you know, let medicine be thy food, right? It's so true. There's another really great book um, by the author. His name is Michael Pollan, uh, P-O-L-L-A-N. I think the book is called, I can't remember what it's called. But anyways, he has a whole bunch of like nutrition principles in there, but really simple, easy to understand nutrition principles as to why you want to make these changes and why you want to eat healthier. But, you know, going back to the research, because I always like going back to the research, um, in terms of food, you know, there's been a lot of dietary recommendations for things like treating, you know, heart, uh, heart disease, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, but food really hasn't been the recommended protocol for mental health until now. So we have a lot of emerging studies right now that are showing that link between food and your mental health. So one of them that I love talking about is the SMILES trial. And this one was done back in two, uh, 2017. So they had two groups of uh, the, like severely depressed patients. They put one group um, just getting social support. So just like talk therapy. And then that second group got that social support or that talk therapy, but they were also put on a Mediterranean diet. The mm. Mediterranean diet is lots of, you know, fish, um, lots of vegetables, fruits, healthy fats, that sort of thing. So they followed both groups for 12 weeks. And what they found was the group that was having that talk support in addition to the Mediterranean diet they had a much, much greater reduction in their depressive symptoms and in their symptoms of anxiety, okay? Wow. So I'm gonna tell you right now that if any drug could do what they were able to do in that trial, just with food, it would be a billion dollar drug. Right. But they don't like to talk about this, right? They right. don't like to talk about the, And that's why like as a culinary nutritionist, again, it goes back to food being medicine. It goes back to, you know, eating the right foods to prevent disease, eating the right foods to, you know, treat and heal from disease. Okay. So we're seeing with depression that yes, you know, food can be a huge component of that. Of, of course, you still want to get, you know, talk to a professional, you still want to see a psychotherapist or whatever it may be. But if you add food into that equation as well, oh my God, like the results you're going to see are going to be like, it will blow your mind. Yeah. We got to get away from, you know, a quick fix to everything. Like you, everybody wants a pill, a 30 day diet, you know, speak to a therapist once and I'm fixed. Everybody wants a quick fix. And you have to understand that it didn't take you over. You didn't get where you are overnight in terms of your health and your wellness, even your finances. It took time. So the same way that it took time to get you where you are with the challenges that you may have in your health or your, your mental health or your relationships or your finances, it's going to take time to get out of that. Mm -hmm. And so we have to get away from everything has to happen quick because mm -hmm. sometimes when everything happens quick, like a diet, that might not be the best thing for you. It might actually mm -hmm. do more harm than good. And so mm -hmm. getting back to the foundations of eating healthy, you know, of exercising, of taking breaks, of pausing, you know, going for walks, getting out into nature. These are all things that a lot of us know, but we just don't make time for. And um, yeah. I think it's important that we do, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, and you said something really important there, Danny. Like a lot of people want results like this overnight. Like we live in this instant society right now where we want everything to happen overnight. Okay, even with my weight loss, it was not overnight. It would took months, right? It was about me putting habits into place. And that's why I wrote the book all about it. The book is essentially the journey that I went through to lose the 30 pounds. And it wasn't all just about food, right? Mm -hmm. It was about managing my stress. That's a whole chapter in the book. It was also about my mindset, 
right? The way that you think about yourself, the way that you think about your ability and whether or not you can do something, like that's a huge part of it as well, right? So there's different things, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, making any sort of changes in your life, but mindset really is the ground floor for making any sort of changes in your life, whether it's changes in your health, whether it's changes if like maybe you're trying to start a business, it all starts with mindset that really is like the ground floor for that. So, but specifically when it comes to eating healthier, you know, where I kind of have people start and a lot of people roll their eyes when I tell them this until they actually do it is the food journal. Just start tracking what you're eating and just do it for like a week. Even if you can do it for like maybe five days, you're going to get huge insights because sometimes I'll tell you what happened with me when I started doing the food journal, that's kind of where I started when it came to losing weight. I was just writing down like what I was eating every single day, just tracking what I was eating, just so I can get a full picture of what was happening and where I could tweak things. So you can kind of think of that food journal almost like your GPS. It's going to give you the instructions to tell you where, like how it is that you can get to where you need to go to, right? Did the food journal. I found out that I was dumping like five packs of sugar into my coffee every single day. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that because you're on autopilot, right? That's the thing about habits. You don't think about them. When you put your car in reverse and you back out the driveway, you don't think about that action. You just do it, right? So that was like with the sugar and the coffee. So that's where I started. And I started with that one thing. And, you know, sometimes when we want to make changes in our life, like, you know, we have the best of intentions and we do all of the things. And because we do all of the things, that's when we fail. And then we're like, see, I knew I couldn't do it. No, that's because he didn't start small. He didn't take the first step. So for me, the first step was that sugar. Okay. I started cutting back on the sugar and the coffee. I started putting cinnamon in my coffee in mm. place of the sugar. So that's okay. a tip if you're trying to cut back on sugar in your coffee, because cinnamon has a naturally sweet flavor. Um, it's also great for helping to regulate your blood sugar as well. So once I got that under my belt, once I was able to kind of master cutting back the sugar on the coffee, I felt good. I got that small win under my belt. That's what gave me that motivation. That's what gave me the momentum. And then I added on another thing, you know, conquered that, added on another thing. Was it a slower process? Yes, it was. But was it worth it? Absolutely, because it helped me to, to keep the weight off. It helped me to develop healthier habits like eating less sugar. So just start small, get those small wins under your belt. And that's how you're going to get the motivation and the momentum to keep going. Yeah, but that's so true. And yeah, I mean, you kept the weight off for eight years. You know, a lot of yeah. people, you know, a lot of people see me like, oh, Trudy looks amazing. Well, she, you kept it off for eight years. And one of the, one of the things that you really said that a lot of, anytime you're trying to make a change in your life, I think journaling to understand where you are right now is so important because whether it's food, whether it's finances, whether it's you're trying to take a trip or start a business or buy a house or you have a big goal or a dream, you have to know where your real starting point is. And when it comes to your weight or your food or whatever it is, you got to sit down and document it and get really clear about this is where I am. Mm -hmm. And most of us don't. And we don't because we don't really want to know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No one wants to really sit down and look at the scale or sit down and say, oh, I eat out six times a week or, oh, I'm out, I spend, I'm out spending money at restaurants and, and, and going to uh, lounges and all that stuff. So that's where all my money's going. A lot of people just don't want that reality check. But when I work with coaching clients, we always start with a reality check. Because you need to know exactly where you are in your life, in the areas that you want to change, if you want to make real sustainable change. Right. Right. You can't just, you can't. And so that's why journaling, that's why a reality check is really important to make that transition moving forward. So I agree with you when it comes to food journaling and understanding what you're eating, where you're spending your money, all of that stuff is so important. Mm -hmm. And so you talk about, you know, I heard you say this all the time, you know, make stress your superpower, make stress <laughs> your superpower. I'm like, girl, stop it. But what? <laughs> talk to people and, and tell them what that means. Well, you know, the whole idea behind that concept is that nobody is going to be free of stress. It is always going to be there, but you can master the way that you react to it and rise above it so that it no longer has this immense sense of control over you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want you to start thinking about stress as an invitation. It's an invitation 
to where it is that you need to redesign your life. Okay, if you're feeling really stressed out about something right now, stop. Ask yourself some questions, okay? We need to ask ourselves more empowering questions because that's really going to help to be the catalyst for the change that we want to see in our life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why I say stress is a superpower because it's, it's trying to tell you something. You're feeling that way for a reason. It's because your life is out of alignment in some way. Mm -hmm. You're saying that you value certain things, whether it's health, whether it's love, whether it's family, but then you're doing other things. So there's a, a misalignment with what you're saying that you're valuing, but what it is that you're actually doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, stress is an invitation. It's an invitation for you to go deeper and understand where you need to start to make some changes in your life. So that's why I always tell people stress can be a really good thing if you just stop and pay attention and take the time to understand what it is trying to tell you. Yeah. Stress is an invitation. Yeah. yeah. An invitation to pay attention to what's going on with you. Yeah, I like that. That's really good, babe. Um, because there's so much stuff going on with the pandemic, and, and you already kind of talked a little bit about some of this, but I'm sure people have been coming to you saying, look, the pandemic, I'm, I'm stressed out, I'm not eating right, and all that kind of stuff. And same with me, I have people coming to me saying the same thing. Well, like, what advice would you give to some people right now who are trying to get back on track with their eating and their health? as a result of this pandemic? You know, first of all, you need to have grace on yourself because I think sometimes, you know, we might have the best of intentions and then we start to eat healthier and then for whatever reason, it doesn't work out. Like we say, we're gonna cook something and then we don't end up cooking it because maybe we had a long day or we had a bad day or the day went longer than we thought. And then we order pizza hmm. and then we beat ourselves up because we've made that decision, right? Because we didn't follow through on what we said we were gonna do. So I think first and foremost, we need to hold grace and we need to hold compassion for ourselves. It is not about being perfect when it comes to eating healthier. I'm a nutritionist. I don't eat perfect. I love pizza. I love Papa John's. <laughs> <laughs> so Danny and I have our pizza night. That's right. One night a week, we allow ourselves to have pizza. Yep. I also like wine. Okay. So I fit the wine in as well. Okay. So I want you to release that, that need and that feeling to be perfect. It's not about being perfect. And if anybody tells you they eat perfectly all the time, they are lying. I'm sorry to tell you this, but they are lying. So first of all, that's the first step is to have grace for yourself or, you know, for yourself or with yourself. Um, and the second tip, like I said, is, you know, start investigating, like seeing what it is that you're currently doing right now, like looking at your eating habits. So start writing things down. Mm. Okay. So tomorrow, I want people to start doing this tomorrow. You can even start doing this today. If you like, just whip out your phone, just open the notes app on your phone, breakfast, you know, bagel with cream cheese, you know, double mocha chocolate latte or whatever, whatever it is you eat. Start paying attention to what it is you're eating. And when you look at that food journal at the end of the week, you're going to be like, oh, shoot. Like, I knew I like cookies. I didn't know I was eating eight cookies a night, <laughs> right? So that's the thing. Like, when you have that there in black and white, there's no denying that because now you have that evidence is right there in front of you, right? So that's why I always, you know, encourage people to start tracking what they eat, not to be obsessed about, you know, what they're eating and, and you know, what they're not eating. That's not the point. The point is it's to give you a starting point. Because a lot of people will say to me, Trudy, I want to eat healthier. I just don't know where to start. That's where you start. You have to start with what's going on right now. Okay. And that food tracking is going to help you to do that. And then once you see everything in black and white, you're going to clearly see where it is that you might need to start making some changes in your health. You might notice you're eating a lot of sugar, you know, sugar laden food. Maybe that's where you need to start. And then just pick that one thing. Don't add in all the things. Okay. I'm going to have the green smoothie. I'm going to work out five times a week. I'm going to like, don't do all the things. Just pick one thing. And then once you start to get that under your belt, then you add another thing and just make sure to celebrate your success along the way. Like no matter how small, maybe you had eight cups of water today, but yesterday you only had two. celebrate that celebrate the wins, no matter how small, because that is how you get momentum. Yeah, that's, that's true. I think we get overwhelmed with trying to do too many things and you just got to do one thing first get one thing down, make the one thing a habit, and then move on to the next thing. Too many people overwhelm themselves by trying to do way too many things. And uh, I think that's, that's definitely a, a good point for sure. You know, there's so many people like, you know, we have these conversations all the time, but we know a lot of people who just feel stuck in their life and they just don't know what's next, not even necessarily with food, but with anything, like what advice would you give to somebody right now who just like, they feel stuck because you were in the corporate world, you kind of felt stuck in your corporate job. And then you just decided to, to take a risk and, and try different things. 
But what, what advice would you give to someone right now who's feeling stuck, feeling like they don't know what's next, but they, they, they're kind of, they kind of want to try something, but other people don't believe in them, so they don't do it. What, what advice would you give to somebody right now? I would say like pay attention to your thoughts, pay attention to how you're feeling. I think that's really important because in our society right now, we are just so busy checking things off the list. We're going from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. We're not taking the time to really stop and check in with ourselves. And I say this because I was there. Like I was so guilty of that. Like I am a multitasker. I, you know, was a workaholic. I was just doing one thing after the next, one thing after the next, one thing after the next, never stopping, never pausing. When you don't stop, when you don't pause in your life, you don't really get that opportunity to check in with yourself, to see how you're feeling, to see how you're doing. And when you keep doing that, that's when you end up feeling stressed. That's mm -hmm. when you end up feeling burnt out. So I would say, you know, really stop and just, and just pay attention to what you're thinking and what you're feeling. It could just even just being the stopping in the middle of the day and just say, okay, just checking in with yourself. Okay, Trudy, how do you feel right now? Okay, well, why is it that you feel that way? Okay, well, what is it that was one thing you could do differently today? You know, just asking yourself like more empowering questions. And then I would also say like journaling, just writing things out. Like, and I love starting with prompts. So if you go on Pinterest, or even if you Google it and just search writing prompts, that way you'll you'll be able to start writing more easily because I know some people they don't want to write or they don't want to journal because they're like I don't know what to say like I don't know what to write down True. but if you just have like that writing prompt it's going to start to jog those thoughts out of your head and it's so important that we get those thoughts out of our head and onto paper because if you try to just you know figure out everything in your mind you're not really going to be able to to you know get through it like you have to, well, I shouldn't, say, I shouldn't say you have to do it, but I suggest that you write it down because when you do write it down, you're going to find that you're actually going to start to work through a lot of those thoughts that are in your head by actually putting them on paper. And then it just might actually come easily to you that you know where you need to start. You might start writing something down. Maybe something will come out of your childhood and you're like, you know what, when I was younger, I really loved baking. I mm -hmm. loved being in the kitchen. Like I was really good at that. Like, what if I started doing that again? Right. So you just never know what's going to happen when you start just putting pen to paper and just writing things out. But, I, you know, and again, that even that act of journaling, that's the process of slowing down. That's a process of checking in with yourself. Yeah. Journaling is powerful. And, and, and I think, you know, you're right. Going online and looking for prompts because a lot of people don't know where to start. But journaling is also like you're opening up chambers into your subconscious, like well, even you, like. I remember having a conversation with you about you're doing nutrition now and you did cupcakes before. And in the big, I remember at that time, you didn't make the connection back to the fact that you used to cook when you were younger, like, you know, and then you, we sat down and we talked about it. You're like, yeah, I, like I, I've always been in the kitchen. And so I think it leaves clues when you sit down and you journal. And the other thing about journaling is it helps you to get clear about where you are and where you want to go. The more you sit down and you write like how you're feeling, what's going on, what you want in the future, the, the more clear it becomes. And then you can start to kind of visualize success. And when you do those things, what happens is your subconscious mind just starts working, like working for you. Like, have you ever decided that you wanted to eat healthier or you were, you were on your journey to become healthier? And then you realize that you're taking the steps at work. And you're like, why am I taking the steps? I always take the elevator or you get off the bus a stop earlier, or you realize that instead of going and getting fast food for lunch, you get a healthier option. And it just starts happening automatically because you're programming your subconscious mind through journaling, through writing down your goals, through um, visualization, through vision boards. And a lot of people don't understand that there's a lot of power in that, that subconscious mind, right? So I agree with you, writing it down is definitely something that we should all be doing, you know? Yeah. So you talk, you, you, you mentioned that this, you have this RISE method. What does RISE stand for? Oh, okay. So you might go through that. Let's do that. Yeah, I just want to, <laughs> cause you know, I, 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 li I like acronyms and I think people can remember acronyms. And so, yeah, talk to people about what the RISE method is. Yeah, so this just goes all back to the idea that you know nobody is free of stress, but you can master the, the master the way that you react to it and rise above it. So hence the rise um, system, so that like it no that. longer has power over you, right? So the rise is the rise method, right? And this is really important because there's so many different physical ailments and illnesses that we can actually link to stress. Um, stress can impact your memory. So if you're having memory problems, that's because 
you know, when you're under severe amounts of stress, it actually affects your hippocampus. That's the part of your brain that's responsible for learning as well as memory. You know, when you're stressed out, it incre increases your cravings for sugar and fat, um, belly fat. It can actually contribute to belly flat, fat. It can contribute to, you know, increased blood sugar levels and all those things. So that knowing that, that's why I developed the RISE system to help people to, you know, turn stress around. So, you know, the R is for ruminating. So ruminating, the best way that I can explain it is if something like just picture something happened to you, like maybe you had something happen at work, like you had a conversation with a coworker, the conversation didn't go as well as you thought it would. Maybe you said something to the coworker that you shouldn't have said. And now you're replaying that over and over and over again in your mind. That is ruminating. Okay. When you keep, you know, replaying that distressing event, what you're actually doing is you're training your emotional brain to become even stronger. And mm. this means that you're going to spend more time ruminating in the future. Okay. So instead, you know, like I said, I would say, let that energy of stress, because stress is an energy, let that energy of stress be the thing that drives you towards where it is that you want to go. Don't spend your time focusing on all of those things that you don't want in your life. Instead, try focusing on the direction of your life that you want to go in. Okay. Um, if you're just sitting around, just, you know, not giving or not feeling the love that you want to have. Maybe you say, okay, I don't have any money. Like, I, how can I get more money? I'm always broke. Like, don't think about the fact that you're broke. It's like, what can I do to get myself out of the situation? Okay, again, it's, it's asking yourself more empowering questions. So don't think of that situation as happening to you. Think about it as happening for you, okay? So that's, you know, rumination, just ruminating on things over and over and over again. So the way that I like to help people to move past that is with, and Danny, I know you talk about this as well, it's with catch, release, replace. Mm -hmm. And it's a really simple thing that you can do just right in the moment, you know, and catch is just, you know, catching that thought and just observing that thought. Because when you have these negative thoughts, really, it's just your brain just trying to protect you. It's really just doing its job. So when you have that thought, just catch the thought and just say to yourself, hmm, that's an interesting thought. Okay. And you can even like do some breathing exercises as you're doing this. Okay. Um, and then with release, you know, you need to release that thought and then try to replace it with something that is more empowering. Okay. So that's the replace part The replaces, re you know, replacing it with something that's a little bit more empowering. And with the release part, I like to just kind of picture that thought, that negative thought, almost like a cloud in the sky, because the clouds are always going to be there. The clouds are going to disappear, but they just keep moving along. Right. So that's how you have to think about the thought. It's just like a cloud in the sky. It just moves right out of the way. It's not sit sitting there in front of you all the time. It just moves right out of the way. Okay. So that's catch, release, replace. So just do that in the moment whenever you're feeling stressed. And you can just do that by taking a few deep breaths as you go through that exercise. Um, so that is the R in rise. Um, and then the I is for inflammation. And this is also a really important one because stress really is the cause of all inflammatory response in our body. Okay. And, and inflammation can lead to lots of different types of diseases, you know, cancer, diabetes, dementia, depression, so many different things. Yeah. So with, you know, with inflammation, we need to try to eat those foods that help to lower inflammation in our body. Um, because the standard American diet, which is the diet that a lot of people eat these days, you know, are really loaded with a lot of processed foods, you know, high sugar foods and leave very little room for, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables, you know, healthy fats and that sort of thing. So, you know, we need to add in more of those anti-inflammatory foods. So that's things like, you know, greens, turmeric, mm. um, you know, green tea, blueberries, like all these different things. Um, ginger is also a really great one as well. I put ginger in a lot of different things. And think about this as adding things into your diet. So rather than thinking about, oh my God, there's so many things I can't have. Think about the things that you're adding into your diet. Think about the ways that you are nurturing your body. Think about the ways that you're increasing your longevity right? Because a lot of us don't think about that. When we think about health, we tend to think about the belly fat or the arms. We don't necessarily think about longevity. Right. So that's I. Um, so S is, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, S is stress busting nutrients. Um, you know, so there's certain nutrients that get depleted in your body during times of stress. So I talked about B vitamins. I talked about iron. Um, you know, another one that gets depleted during, um, in your body during times of stress is vitamin C. That's also another one as well. That's really important for, you know, maintaining your immune system. So, you know, we want to make sure our immune systems are strong these days for sure. You know, so try adding in, you know, some of those iron rich foods that I talked about, you know, the spinach, the broccoli, the lentils. And if you go on my website, if you just search any one of these words, you're going to see all sorts of things pop up and yummy recipes. Um, and then uh, lastly, the E is for emphasis on gut health. Okay. And this is probably the most, I don't want to say it's the most important one, but it's super important because your gut really is considered to be your second brain. Mm -hmm. And 
and this is the reason, the reason why is because your brain sends messages to your gut and your gut sends messages to your brain. And this is done through neurotransmitters that I talked about earlier, like serotonin, right? Um, so we really want to make sure that we're nurturing our gut health because what's good for your gut is also good for your brain. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is important because we're seeing things like Alzheimer's, we're seeing things like dementia on the rise. So we really need to make sure that we're, you know, nourishing our gut which is gonna to help to nourish our brain, which is gonna to help to enhance our cognitive health, our cognitive functioning so that we age well in life, okay? And I talk about this because I know a lot of people now are like, well, a lot of people that we roll with now are like, you know, in their forties, you know, people are going into their fifties, but really now this is the time to start really getting on top of, you know, some of these things um, and some of these foods. So, you know, what, when it comes to nurturing your gut health, you can add in probiotics and, and uh, probiotics. So prebiotics and probiotics. And people always, you know, ask you, what's the difference? I was so just thinking the same thing. I'm like, I don't know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> so probiotics are your gut's beneficial bacteria, while prebiotics are food for that bacteria. So how I like to explain this is I like to talk about, I like to explain it in like the terms of Pac-Man. So if you know the Pac-Man game, maybe I'm dating myself, but yeah. I used to have Atari back in the day with a little joystick, right? <laughs> and I used to play Atari and my favorite game was Pac-Man. So when it comes to prebiotics and, and, and pro, prebiotics and probiotics, think about Pac-Man, okay? So look at picture the Pac-Man game, that is your gut, okay? The little Pac-Man guy, that is the probiotics. The little dots that it eats, those are the prebiotics. So that's like the best way that I can kind of explain it. The prebiotics are food for your gut's bacteria, okay? Um, and there's lots of yummy foods that you can add to add in some of these probiotics and prebiotics. You could take a probiotic or a prebiotic every single day, right? But again, I'm a culinary nutritionist. I want people to be getting these from foods first. Um, so probiotics, you can find them in like fermented foods. Um, so things like kefir, um, sauerkraut, miso, kimchi, that sort of thing. Um, I would suggest people start with miso because miso, there's so many things you can do with it. Like I like making like sort of like marinades with it or, you know, um, sort of, you know, any sort of sauces, salad dressings tastes really great with miso. Where, where can people get miso? Where can they get it? Any health, any health food store. Um, you might be able to order on Amazon now. Okay. If you're watching this in the U.S., there's Thrive Market. You can get so many uh, delicious things, like yeah. great health foods on Thrive Market. Okay. Um, sometimes I wish I was in the U.S. so I could order from Thrive Market. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I would suggest starting with miso. That's a good one to kind of start with. Greek yogurt's a good one, too. Um, and then there's prebiotics. So prebiotic sources include um, asparagus, um, artichokes, onions, leeks is a good one, and garlic. Okay, so just add in some garlic, start adding in that and a little bit more into your meals. Start maybe swapping out onions and using leeks instead. A lot of us don't use leeks, but they taste so good and they add so much flavor to food. So again, just, you know, trying out different things, like have fun with experimenting and, and swapping out some of these things in your kitchen. But those are some of the great, the best sources of probiotics and prebiotics. Wow, man, that was a master class that you just did right there. <laughs> Oh, I, well, I should have been writing all that. I, I should have been writing. That was like, wow, that was really good. <laughs> and, you know, I think simple things, garlic, asparagus, things that you can find at the grocery store, just eat more of it. Yeah. Like, it's not even that complicated, really. That's when you get to tap into your creativity. It's like, oh, well, what can I do with asparagus? What can I do with ginger? So I think a lot of people think it's complicated, but it's really not. It's just, you know, going in in doing some research to find out what are some more things I should be eating more of and then finding creative ways to, to add them to your meals. Like maybe chopping up some asparagus when you're eating some eggs in the morning, like it, it doesn't have to be complicated. And this is why you're so smart. See, she's, she's Trudy is so smart. This is why I married this woman. She's smart. She's beautiful, man. I mean, that was just, that, that was a masterclass there. I really like that. And I think it's easy for people to um, to incorporate these things. I think when people hear eating healthy, they think complicated, but it's not. Like we just talked about so many simple things that you could add to your food. Garlic, ginger, like that's yeah. easy to add in. Blueberries. Yeah, blueberries. blueberries is a good one. That's a good one. Like blueberries, man, there's so many benefits to blueberries. If you just like Googled it and looked at the research, you're going to see like, Blueberries have been linked to um, improve memory as well. They've done studies, you know, with adults and they've shown that blueberries have actually helped to increase memory, um, you know, mm. in people. So, so many different things you can do, like blueberries are a great source of fiber. They're a great source of antioxidants. Like just add them to your smoothie. That's all you got to do. 
put them in yeah. your smoothie in the morning. Maybe add some almond butter in there. I love adding almond butter because it makes the smoothie nice and creamy and delicious. It's a mm. great source of healthy fat, great source of vitamin E, which is great for your hair, your skin, and your nails, ladies. Mm. Um, so, you know, just, just, I always like making things taste delicious. Just because it tastes, just because it's healthy, it shouldn't taste bad. And I'm a huge advocate of this because a lot of times people will make healthy recipes and dishes and it doesn't taste good. It doesn't look good. I eat with my eyes. So it's got to look pretty. I don't, that's just me. I eat with my eyes. So I like to make it look pretty, but most importantly, it's got to taste good. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it definitely has to taste good. I, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not somebody to eat something if it doesn't taste good. I don't care how healthy it is. It has to taste good. So yeah. I agree with that. You know, one of the things I too, I love too, is the, the, the whole, catch release replace thing you know we're having these i like that as a part of your rise method and um everybody always asks well how did you guys meet how did you meet and, and i think i might have to start replacing it with the catch release replace i i caught a bad relationship i released her and then i caught tree <laughs> I love that i can get behind that one I when like people that. ask me how how did you attribute me i don't want to be a catch release replace that's what i'm <laughs> I, I like start, that one. I'm gonna okay, start that's saying good. that. That's good. <laughs> people, people always ask. So I guess um, the short answer is we met online. How many years ago was that? Twelve years oh ago. Oh my, twelve. Come on, more than that. Like I want to say fourteen. Now. Oh, two thousand and seven. Yeah. Two thousand and seven. Yes. Two thousand seven. Yeah. Look, we met online in two thousand and seven when nobody was really even meeting online. And it's funny because we met on a, a website called Black Planet. I don't even know if it's still around. And people are always like, how did you guys meet? And we say we met online. It's normal now in 2022. But back then when we, was, we said we met online, people were like, what? Why did you meet online? You're both good looking people. You can meet people. But we met online in 2007. And there's a whole other story that we'll tell another time. And we ended up talking all night. And then the next day we went out for coffee. She had coffee. I had hot chocolate. <laughs> and and then uh, and then she fell in love with me. And that was that was it. Oh, after, oh, that, that's what happened. after that, she's oh, like, I never oh. she never let me go since. And that's that's oh. pretty much how the story goes. <laughs> you know, that's the short, there's a longer, a longer version, but that's the short version version <laughs> that's the truth that's the we did the truth was you fell in love with me and i was the best thing that ever happened to you that's um, the truth that, that's your version my version <laughs> is the real but anyway uh yeah so that a lot of people always ask and, and 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 people always like they love seeing us do stuff together so you know i love the fact that we do have a chance every once in a while to get together and do things and this podcast episode, I'm sure a lot of people are going to really love this because when we always get together, we have jokes and, but we also get to share information and share what we're learning. And, um, you know, one of the things I remember, I just wanted to go back there for a second is like, I remember when I was working in my corporate job and I was doing my side hustle, I, I had a, a, a training company on the side and I was working all these crazy hours. I would work my job eight to 10 hours then come back and I'd be up till early in the morning working on the business. And at the time you were like, why are you doing all this? This is like, this is crazy. And I, and I just said, you need to be an entrepreneur to understand. And you just never understood. Like I was working 16, 18 hours and you just, you didn't get it. And then once you became an entrepreneur, then you realized <laughs> You were, you know, you were working your full time job and you would come home and work on your business. It was the event business or the cupcake business or the, and then, you know, the nutrition business and then quit your job eventually. But then you started to realize what it was. And I think for a lot of people out there, if you're an entrepreneur, a lot of people aren't going to understand the grind until they are, they're actually in it themselves. Like, there was no way for you to understand what I was going through until you became an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's so true. And, you know, I was just thinking as you're talking, I'm just thinking about it. And really, it just, I don't know. For me, it just comes down to helping people. I just really love to help people. And I think my mom, I got that from my mom. My mom's the same way. My mom was a nurse um, for many years. And she always just took care of people. So I kind of grew up seeing that. And I think maybe that kind of rubbed off on me. It's just always 
wanting to take care of people. And, you know, I was actually just thinking when I kind of went off on a different tangent there, I kind of, you know, blanked out a little bit. I was thinking about yesterday. I didn't even tell you about this yesterday. Traffic was busy and I was outside for a walk. And then this woman was trying to reverse out of her driveway, but nobody would let her stop. Like the traffic just kept going and no one would let her stop to back out of her driveway. So I'm walking, I'm approaching her. I'm seeing the panic on her face. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to help this lady out. So I actually got into, I stepped into the road and I like held up the traffic and I allowed her to back out of the driveway. And I was like, you know what, Trudy, you see, <laughs> so, so sometimes I do it to a fault. Like sometimes I'm a little bit too overwhelmed with helping people, but yeah, you know, when it comes down to, you know, entrepreneurship, it really, it just needs to be something that you really enjoy doing something you're really passionate about, because I know some people that will start certain businesses because somebody else started it. Oh, you know, maybe your cousin's a real estate agent and they're a successful real estate agent. They're making a lot of money. So you think, oh my God, they're making a lot of money doing that. I'm going to do that too. But you're not passionate about that. Right. Right. Um, I know people wanted to some, um, wanted me to sell insurance back in the day. Like, oh my God, you can make so much money selling insurance. And I tried it and I was like, mm, I'm not passionate about this. This is not for me. So if you want to become an entrepreneur, it needs to be something you're really passionate about doing because you are going to be spending a lot of time, do, a lot of time doing it. It might not always go smoothly, but if it's something again, that you are really passionate about doing, then you'll stick with it. Yeah. That's good advice. That's good advice. Look, we could sit here and talk all day. Well, we live together. So we do talk all day, <laughs> <laughs> but listen, uh, I want to, I want to end with a couple questions that I ask everybody who comes on the show. Uh, the first question is, when you think of the word grind, what does that mean to you? Oh, grind is like never settling for less, never, you know, never settling for your, circum your, your current circumstances and always wanting more for yourself and doing whatever it takes to, to see more for yourself. Yeah, I like that. I like that. And what does the word gratitude mean to you? Oh, man, gratitude. For, that's an important one. You know, sometimes we're just not happy where we are in life. We want to be someplace else. We always want to be someplace else or someplace different in our lives. And we never stop to think about those things that we do have in our lives that we should be grateful for. You know, even on like the toughest days, like sometimes when I have, you know, really bad days and we all have bad days, you know, just the fact that I'm sitting in a house right now, I have four walls around me. Like I have a house, I have a home. That is something to be grateful for. You know, I share this home with my amazing husband that is something to be grateful for. I can see the walls around me. I have eyesight. That is something to be grateful for. So, you know, whenever things don't appear to be going right in your life, whenever you're feeling challenged, always stop and just, you know, think of three things in your life that you're grateful mm. for. Yeah, that's so good. That's so good. You know, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for the life that we're building together. You know, I wake up in gratitude every day and just think of at least seven to 10 things that I'm grateful for. So, yeah. and I'm grateful that you decided to finally come on my show. Listen, I've been asking this woman to come on my show forever. And finally, on the 100th episode, I got my wife, Trudy Stone. Isn't that crazy, everybody? Hey. I live with this woman. I live with her and I couldn't <laughs> even get it. That's how busy she is. But, you know, Trudy, I want to say thank you for coming on the show I know that a lot of people are going to really love this episode and the tips that you really shared to help people take control of their health and their mindset is really important. And I tell you this all the time, but I love the work that you're doing. I love seeing you on TV. I love seeing you coaching people. I love seeing you, you know, going into these organizations and helping to trans people's, transform people's health and mindsets and wellness. So I just want to say, Thank you so much again for being here. And um, I really just appreciate everything that you're doing to help people really better themselves in the world. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. Congratulations again on 100 episodes. You know, and I want to give you your flowers too, Danny, because you reached 100 episodes and that's not something a lot of people do. And you are just, you're so consistent. You're so good at being consistent and, you know, the results of everything you've achieved in your life show it, you know, where you are, where you're going in your life, that, that, that determines your consistency. And you're so good at doing that. Like in every aspect of your life, you're consistent. Like, and I can tell you, like, I live with the guy, I'm married to the guy, like what you see with Danny, like he is this way, he's this way 24 seven. Okay. He is consistent. So, you know, kudos to you. Congratulations again for your 100th episode. And thank you so much for having me as your guest on the 100th episode. I feel so honored. 
Of course, of <laughs> course. And thank you for the kind words. Tell everybody where they can reach you and where they can find out more about everything you're doing. You can find me on the gram at Trudy E. Stone. You can also find me on Facebook on Trudy E. Stone. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn as well. I don't know, just like type in the search browser, Trudy Stone, and you'll find me. I don't know what the URL is or anything like that there. Um, you can also find me on my website, trudyestone.com. And you can also pick up my book. If you want to learn the seven habits that I use to, you know, lose 30 pounds and keep it off and just to eat healthier overall, you know, pick up my book, Unbreakable. You can find that on Amazon, um, Unbreakable, the seven habits to your rough, solid health. So pick that up as well. That's right. Go out there and pick up that book, everybody. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Grind and Gratitude Show. I love all of my all of you for tuning in. Thank you for continuing to send me messages to to share, to leave reviews. It means so much to me. And I will catch you all in the next episode. Take care, everybody.